Welcome back to DIY Guitar Making at Eric Schaefer Guitars. Here we are in the shop. We're going to do Q&A. There's just two things I want to bring to your attention before we get started. One, if you check out on my website, ericschaeferguitars.com, you will see I put up some new dates for acoustic guitar build workshops in the fall and even into the winter, which I haven't done winter workshops before. I've always had them spring and fall. So there's an opportunity for you if spring and fall never worked out. We've got some dates in the winter now. And in addition to that, I'm gonna be answering questions from the Discord here, the Discord server. That's um, where I've moved the members forum that is associated with the online guitar building school. And I just wanna remind everyone who has bought the online course, Building an OM Acoustic, or if you've taken one of my hands-on workshops, you have an invite link somewhere in your email, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that you need to follow to get yourself into this forum. The old forum that I had on the website is now defunct and I've moved all of the interactions that were, we were having there onto this slick and sleek and beautiful Discord server. So it works much better there. So anyway, you already have access to this. You've already paid for this if you've bought the online course. So please check your email, follow that link, and join us in the many discussions that we're having. With that, let's jump right into the first one I have here. So R. Breen writes, what thickness do you start out with for the rosette? Also, how deep do you cut the rosette channel into the soundboard? Okay, so this is the kind of thing that you really don't have to overthink or you know lose any sleep over. Um, let me, hold off one second, let me grab uh, some materials so we can look at them and talk about them. All right, so I've brought a couple different materials here that you might end up using for a rosette. I got some pearl, I have a dyed fiber strip, very common for rosettes. And here's just a piece of wood as an example, because, hey, you might want to make a solid wood rosette or a radial wood rosette. <coughs> You're going to hear a lot of coughing and clearing of my throat today. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm uh, not feeling too hot. So the main... I, I can answer this question very simply. Honestly, I'm probably going to go a little deeper, but you, you don't need to even hear it because the simple answer is as long as you don't embed the material so deep that you route through the thickness of your soundboard, because the soundboard's not that thick, and you don't embed the material so shallowly, shallowly, if that's a word, if you don't embed it so shallow that you risk sanding through the material. If you inlay, say, this dyed fiber strip only a couple thousandths of an inch into the soundboard, through the process of sanding that level and then eventually sanding your binding level as well, which is you're going to end up swiping across and removing a little bit more material off your rosette at that point, and then doing all your finish sanding, every time you sand that top, you are taking more thousandths of an inch off of there. It might not be much, but it actually adds up if you're the kind of person who just over sands like that. So you want to make sure whatever material you're using, that it's deep enough that you're not going to sand through it. Um, it's not something I've really thought about to give you a, a specific number, but off the top of my head for something like a rosette, if it's in there, 40 thousandths of an inch, I feel, I think I would feel pretty confident that, that that's good. See, the thing is your rosette, depending on what material you use, specifically with like a solid wood rosette, it's possible with a little bit of poor execution in gluing it in that it might not be fully seated all the way around in the channel. I like to put a weight on top of my rosette as I'm gluing it. Um, I also kind of tap in the ends with a fretting hammer. I, I go around the whole thing and tap it in because I want it to seat at the bottom of the channel. But it is very common, especially for new builders, to have their 
it not be fully seated all the way around, which would mean you might have been striving for a certain depth, but if the rosette is allowed to sort of rise up at one side or the other, then it's going to be thinner than you thought it was, and that's how you end up sanding it through. Maybe you aimed for 40 thousandths of an inch, but it's only 10 thousandths of an inch in there um, on one side. Very likely, if it's only embedded 10 thousandths of an inch, that you're going to sand through it. So, one thing I want to point out is that pearl always comes in very thin blanks, and you can't really control that. Uh, it's a limitation of the material itself. Suppliers really can only provide shell blanks that are only so thick, about 50 thousandths of an inch it looks like here, 55 maybe. Uh, and that might vary a little bit, but it, it's really, they're very limited in, in how they can provide pearl to you because of the limitations based on the fact that it's coming from a natural material, which is animal shell. And if you've ever seen the shell of this gastropod that they get mother of pearl from, it's relatively small and it's very curved. So the way to deal with that is to slice out these thin sections. Uh, for example, if you were making a very large inlay, you actually have to assemble a whole bunch of smaller pieces to get there. But anyway, I just wanted to mention that it's not like you go on a supplier's website and there's going to be all these different thicknesses and you have to make a decision. You you get what you get and pearl can actually sometimes be tricky in that way, especially for new builders because it's so thin to begin with that you uh, can't afford to make any mistakes, right? It's very easy to sand through this material. A little bit thicker, quite a bit thicker, or taller I should say, is the, are these dyed fiber strips you can get from Stumac or LMI. It's all pretty much the same no matter where you get these. Um, Gurian Instruments and uh, what is this, 85? It, it kind of varies. It's not cut very consistently. Uh, I usually notice so I'm seeing anything from 75 to 85, depending on where I check this, maybe even 90. And so this is quite a bit taller, so you have a lot more leeway. This is easier for new builders in a number of ways, not just as far as the channel depth is concerned. This is just a much easier material to work with. Great for a first guitar. And then lastly, solid wood rosette. I actually like to build to make my radial rosettes or any kind of rosette that I'm using out of uh, several cut pieces of solid wood, I will leave that much thicker, more like an eighth of an inch at a minimum, uh, but often even quite a bit bigger, you know, something like this, which here it's 70 thousandths of an inch. So I let, the point is I like to leave these much bigger simply because in order to construct this rosette and have it be stable and not cracking and falling apart before I get it into the channel, uh, it's good to have it be nice and stout in thickness. Okay? And then, but, you know, once I cut my channel, I don't need to route it anywhere near as deep as it is thick. Uh, I'm just going to have more to plane off the top and, and sand level once I have it in there. Okay? So basically the, the idea is you're always embedding your rosette just enough to be very confident that you're not going to sand through it and then the rest sits proud over the soundboard and it gets planed and sanded flush after the fact. Let's check out our next question. That was a great question, Arbreen. Thank you for asking it. And let's see what else we got here. Okay, Doc Joe, let's read this one. Oh good, there's a whole conversation in here. So I had my bandsaw set up for cutting the scarf joint and in the middle of that, my bandsaw blade broke. I did have a replacement, an older blade, and was able to finish that cut. However, when cutting down the thickness of the headstock, the blade wandered a little because the saw blade wasn't tight. So at one end, it was about three-eighths of an inch thick, and at the other end, about a half inch. 
After I made the scarf joint and glued it, I planed the headstock to about 3 eighths of an inch. Do you think this thickness plus that of the headstock plate of about an eighth of an inch should be strong enough? I think it should be, but I just wanted to double check. So a couple things, your tuners. That's the first thing that comes to mind is you want to check out the tuners that you plan on using. There will be certain minimum dimensions that need to be met as far as the thickness of the head stock and head plate put together. Okay, head stock plus head plate, whatever that thickness is. Um, check out the back of the package of the tuners. There'll usually be information that gives you uh, an idea of that, or if not, get online and look it up. And you'll be able to find it. Um, usually they're, they're provided within the instructions for installing those tuners, whatever those tuners are. But very often uh, it's a half inch. As uh, Very often I find a half inch is the minimum. You guys can correct me if I'm wrong with that, but a lot of the tuners I've seen half inch is the minimum. So you were aiming for a half inch with just your headstock. Now when you add the head plate, you should be over a half inch, even if your bandsaw blade forced you to dip a little bit under, right? So hopefully that head plate makes up the difference, but I would check it and make sure that the head plate does make up the difference there. Now, as far as the integrity of the scarf joint itself, I think you're fine. Honestly, if it was me, I would redo it just because that I just because of the consistency of product, right? And that just matters to me a lot. And it's not that hard to make a new neck. But if you're building for yourself, essentially, um, I don't think there would actually functionally be anything wrong with the head stock being a little bit thinner because you can make up the difference with the head plate. And the head plate being glued as a veneer on the top does actually reinforce that scarf joint uh, even though that scarf joint now should be a little bit smaller. Uh, that Put a nice thick head plate on there, and I think the integrity of that headstock would be the same, maybe even improved uh, with the th thickness of the head plate being increased. And uh, oh, let's see, some people respond, LC Guitars responded to this. Um, let's read what he wrote. He writes, I shoot for 9 sixteenths to 5 eighths thick. I would add maybe a black white veneer between the headstock and the head plate, or perhaps a veneer on top and back of the headstock. Ah, yes, the back of the headstock. That's a very good point. Um, also, if you're worried about it, you can do a back plate. Back plates are uh, tricky, so I wouldn't. Uh, again, that that might, if you're considering the back plate, that might be another thing that just gets you to kind of throw up your hands and go, okay, let me just make a new neck blank. But if you have experience with back plates, then that is a great way of uh, just reinforcing that. And they look fantastic. I mean, you're never going to make a guitar look uh, worse with a well-executed back plate. It always looks sharp. So that's a great point. LC Guitars, thank you for that. And, uh, okay. Sorry, I'm just reading a little more of the conversation here. I think that's good. Let's jump around again. Okay, Ala Lush writes, Hi all, I recently saw a classical guitar builder thicknessing the top by hand. Hand plane first, followed by a scraper, and lastly, 120 grit sandpaper to finish. He carefully measured all spots on the soundboard and wrote everything down corresponding with his frequency tests. For the specific top, he did 2.5 millimeters around the sound hole slash middle part and towards 2 millimeters near the edges. This way, he had nice bass responses. I can imagine if one only using a drum sander to thickness towards one general thickness, it is different? <laughs> he asks that like a question. That's why I said it like that. Um, yeah, he's, so the question he's asking is, uh, is this just a different way of approaching, you know, do, doing the general thicknessing? Is that worse? Is it just different? Like what's, what's up with that? And I will say that, you know, my view on that is 
that it is just different. So the interesting thing about guitar making is if you've been in this long enough, you will see, or not even in this, if you've just been on the internet, like watching videos like you, you are right now, if you do that long enough, you will see that there are as many ways to approach voicing as there are brands of guitars out there in existence. So it kind of leads you to the conclusion that, hey, there's, you know, a lot of people are doing different things and nobody's doing all of these approaches. Um, one of the things I kind of see with new builders when you first get into this is a bit overwhelming because you see all these things that other people are doing. And every time you see a new flashy, cool trick or a voicing technique or something like that, you go, oh, I got to start doing that on my guitars. And you start collecting all these little things. And some of those things even will contradict with each other. And, whoa, well, if I'm doing this, it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, but furthermore, you will find that what you need to do is figure out what methods really speak to you and essentially inspire you and pick a couple and start incorporating those as you go you might lose some uh i'll give you an example i used to do deflection tests on my brace blanks i don't do that anymore it didn't really it, it was one of those things it seemed like a good idea i built this little jig for it to carefully measure each brace and for me personally, it, uh, after a little while, it just didn't jar with my style and um, it just didn't seem appropriate or beneficial to me anymore. So I stopped doing it. This is another thing like that, where a lot of classical builders do stuff like this. It reminds me of what archtop makers do do as well where they're actually varying the thickness around the plate it is a super legit thing to do some of the best builders do stuff like this um, but then also some of the best builders just thickness the top to the same thickness all the way around and they put their magic little pixie dust in the voicing of the braces and the carving of the braces or something else um, well, I guess it's usually between those two things. So there's a relationship between the uh, size of the, the bracing and the thickness of the soundboard. And some people play around more with the soundboard itself. And some people play around more with the bracing. And I watched the video. He provided the video here. Advan Kuish. I, I can never say his last name, but I, I've seen uh, a couple of his videos. He's great. So, that's it. I mean, I don't have anything pro or con to say about that. I've never tried it. Try it out. Okay, and this next one is a new member introduction from Doc Joe. We actually already heard from Doc Joe in an earlier question, but I'm going to read what he wrote, uh, just introducing himself here in the forum. He writes, Hello all, I just signed up for the OM course and wanted to say hi. I've built a Stumac Dreadnought from a kit but decided I want to push myself. I've got the front and back plates done, made my side forms, and just started the process of practicing side bending. I was able to get full length rosewood sides from LMI, which is amazing since the practice pieces I got from Stumac were maple. All right, welcome Doc Joe, and uh, good on you for getting some practice sets before you just commit to the real thing. Uh, that's a great tip. For any of you guys out there who are just getting started, um, the first time you bend sides, you are very likely to break them. Probably more likely than to not break them. Or to just end up with really nasty compression marks or little splits on the inside. So, you can work all that out with some inexpensive practice sides. A lot of suppliers like Stu Mac and LMI, um, RC Tonewoods I know does this too. We'll just sell you some basically reject wood that's of side, the proper length for bending sides. And usually it's something that's a little bit easier to bend and you can work out all the kinks on that inexpensive practice wood first before you ruin a nice set. Okay, and I'm just gonna cut it off there. It's a little bit of a short episode here, but 
Uh, like I mentioned before, I'm just not feeling too great, so rather than draw this out and have you listen to my coughing and my froggy voice, we will just, uh, I will sign off right here, and I will say bye for now, and hopefully in the next one, I will feel a little bit better, and I won't have such a froggy voice. So, bye for now. See you guys later. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.